Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar and compliments of the season. Today, my colleague and I, uh, Mr. Kenta from Anthony Campus, will be hosting today's program. Today, we have Mr. Odunaya, who will be speaking on asset management. Mr. Yoshola Odunaya is an alumni of Obafemi Awolowo University and has over 13 years of professional experience initially in the manufacturing sector and subsequently in the financial services sector. He worked with the industrial and farm equipment company and also worked briefly with Nestle Nigeria PLC and Patterson Zoconics Industries, PZ, where he gained valuable experience in the manufacturing and FMCG service sectors. In transitioning to financial services, Yoshola Odunaya worked with WSTC Financial Services Limited, a leading securities trading and financial advisory firm in Nigeria, where he was responsible for managing some high net worth individuals, including providing financial advisory services. Since joining FBN Quest Trustees, he has served multiple roles and teams, including portfolio management, business development and treasury. He is currently the treasurer and head of the Trust Investment Department, FBM Quest Trustees Limited. Welcome, Mr. Odunaya. Thank you very much, Jama. Uh, sometimes hearing it like that, I wonder if it's me they're still talking about. <laughs> but um, thank, thank you for um, introducing me. I, don't think I have much more to say. I do work for the FBM Quest Trustees Limited. I'm currently serving as the treasurer there. I always say that because I have served in multiple roles and it's given me various types of experiences going forward. Um, I've, I've worked with sales, I've worked a bit in operations, and it's basically given me a well-rounded view of what asset management or portfolio management or whatever, however you want to call it is and uh for me i almost feel more like a, you know when you feel like you're just basically part of the company as opposed to just a particular role yeah that's that's pretty much how it is but um thank you very much for the introduction you you're welcome mr udunaya okay what is asset management okay um you know in retrospect it would have been nice to have a little bit more um visual maybe a presentation or something, but what I'll just do, I'll just go straight into the meat and potatoes. Now, asset management essentially is, comes down to one thing. It's the managing of what we call assets, managing of things of value, right? And, and, and the, plan, the, the purpose is to extract additional value from them to increase their worth in a sense over a period of time. Um, now, there are many technical explanations for it. And sometimes people, reduce asset management to just management of money. But um, there are many different types of assets, right? There's, there's, there's cash, um, there's fixed income. Fixed income is when you're talking about, you know, fixed deposits, things that give you interest periodically. You have equities. I mean, these are the ones that are more popular. But then you also have things like real property, intellectual property, quants. So these are things that are slightly softer. And basically, anything that you can put a price on, that gives you, a, you can put value on is an asset and can be managed appropriately, right? So I guess to answer your question, proper asset management, and it could be in any field, financial services, it could even be in education. Proper asset management is taking the things that you hold of value and managing them in such a way that it only provides a service for you, but also increases the value over time, if you can. Okay, sorry, you just said something about managing in education. Please explain. Oh no, what what I what I was trying to what I was trying to touch on was essentially when people say asset management, of course you think immediately financial services. You think somebody counting your money and you know putting it in this investment, that investment. But in pretty much every business, you're gonna to have to have some level of asset management. I mean, take Green Spring School for instance. You have a fleet that I'm sure you manage. You have you have property that I'm sure you manage. You have soft assets that I'm sure you manage, right? It might not be 
to the level of um, financial service where you're looking to make returns because they're serving a particular purpose, but it still has to be managed, right? So technically speaking, all, all falls under the umbrella of asset management. But as a profession, what you're trying to do is take the assets that you have and extract value from them. Um, basically incremental value, uh, basically returns over a period of time um, to meet whatever goals and objectives you have. So that's primarily what I would say asset management is. Good morning, Mr. Odunoya. Um, yeah, I was asking, we're very curious, how did you start your career? Because asset management is, doesn't seem like any of the usual, you know, medicine, engineering. How did you start your career? Okay. Um, I, this, this, this always makes me smile. And um, it's, probably, it's probably good on one speaking on this. Um, I got out of school, wanted to be a mechanical engineer. Um, but I, I changed my mind at some point and studied food science and tech. I was very, I had a, had a whole plan. Food science was gonna be where the world is gonna go. I mean, everybody's gonna need food, right? So we're just gonna study food science and technology and grow in that field. And then somewhere along the lines, which hence my, ex, my experiences in PZ and Nestle, but I wasn't fulfilled. So I had to, I decided to find something else. and. I, I always had a flair for tech, for asset management in a sense. I had a bit of things for equities and math. So I decided to switch careers and uh, took the necessary courses and uh, basically transitioned from Nestle to uh, uh, a stockbroking firm called WSDC. And from there, I basically picked up and went from place to place and here I am at FBM Quest Trustees. Thank you so much. Um, what education, training, or background does your field require? And are there particular subjects to take in secondary school? Um, so in terms of education, what I would suggest, and as, as earlier said, okay, let me start. What, what I would suggest is most finance courses are probably the best that will prepare you best for asset, a career in asset management. We're talking finance, we're talking economics, we're talking accounting, we're talking business administration, whether undergrad or postgrad. You know, um, these are the courses that help equip you best. But um, what I would say about my story and why it is unique is you don't necessarily have to have all the answers right away, right? I studied food science and tech, which has nothing to do with uh, asset management, but there are ways you can transition if you feel at some point, you know, your skills are better suited to asset management. I mean, there are courses to take, there are, there are things to learn, and um, pretty much you don't necessarily, it might help, you don't necessarily have to go back to school to, um, you know, start another five-year course. But um, to answer your question directly, most finance courses, economics, accounting, business administration. But in, in terms of other soft courses that might help you with asset management, generally speaking, we're looking at courses, certification courses like the Chartered Financial Analyst course, CFA, is probably the gold standard. Um, you have uh, Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers, they have, there's a CIS course as well. Also pretty good if you want to trade equities in the country on a professional level. Um, you have a few other courses, left, right, and center. They all uh, the, the the ASI, which is essentially a dealing certificate. So in case you want to work in the treasury and you want to deal, um, there are courses you can take that will give you a slight edge over somebody who doesn't have them. But those are the, those are the actual like you know brick and mortar education type courses. I think um, for asset management, it comes down to what you're good at. You know, you have to have some certain technical skills. Um, you have to have a good appreciation for math, finance. You have to have strong analytical skills. You have to be a critical thinker because uh, you're going to be not just deciding what to do today, but you have to be able to look two, three, four, five steps ahead to make investment decisions. I watch them pay off. And um, 
as as earlier mentioned, you sometimes you even need to have negotiation skills because you're going to be not just relating with clients, you're going to be relating with other market participants, and everybody is all trying to um, achieve the same goals. So these are some of the skills I think you require, courses and skills I think you require for asset management. Okay. So um, so um, you were saying something about CSA. So you said courses, so things that people need to have a professional qualification to be employed for as an asset manager. Or I'm like, what I'm saying is, can you be an asset manager without getting professional qualifications or you need professional qualifications to become a an asset manager? Okay. Um, technically speaking, no, you don't need professional qualifications. But as every profession, to stand out, you need to you need to set yourself apart. And sometimes, not only what you studied in school, but in particular, those professional certifications help you stand apart from the, the crowd. Um, I, I earlier mentioned CFA, there's a chart of financial yes, analysts. Yes, it's the it's pretty much the gold standard when it comes to asset management. You know, people respect you different when you have a CFA, and um, it's it's pretty much. It's a pretty exclusive course. Not many people have it, or not as many people have it as you would think. But um, if you, you are going to pursue a course outside the school, that's a course I would recommend if you want to get ahead, ahead in asset management. So basically, um, asset management is a lifelong, you have to keep on studying if you want well, to stand out, as you said. So... <laughs> Um, it stops. It stops coming about the technical knowledge as opposed to studying things like markets, studying things like performances. You, I mean, for instance, if I'm going to be investing in equities, I can't just look at First Bank today and then never look at them again. I have to keep studying their performances over a period of time to be able to predict how well they are going to do. Yeah. You know. Um, even bond markets, uh, same thing. You, that's where the consistent study will come from. You're studying markets, you're studying, um, you know, news. You're you're trying to try to try to basically get ahead of the competition. Generally speaking, so that you can predict the future. If you can, you can make a decent size amount of money for your company and for yourself. Okay. All right, Mister Udunaya, your your Career sounds very um, interesting. What are your main responsibilities? Oof. Um, wow. So my main responsibilities, I like I said, I run a team. I run a team that cuts across um, the actual trading, that cuts across portfolio management, that cuts across relationship management. And um, what we essentially do is every day we look at the market and we see what um, assets, what investment opportunities there are. So when you're looking for an investment opportunity, you're looking for something that is not valued appropriately. And I, I, I say that I'm not undervalued because I'm, I'm trying to get somewhere. Now, when I look at uh, a house, for instance, and based on all the houses that look like it in a particular area, it is currently, 10 million naira less than the other houses, then I know, okay, this is an opportunity for me to buy because eventually somebody's going to look at the house and realize it's just like the, all the other houses and try to raise the price. And then I can make a 10 million naira profit. So every day across the different investment assets, we sit down and we monitor the markets, see where they are currently pricing certain items, whether it's stocks, whether it's, um, financial instruments like bonds, treasury bills, or whether it's even things like commodities, although we don't actively trade commodities in the country, you know, uh, it's not, not on, a, on a big scale. But, you know, things like that, you look for where there is a dip in value or there is an overvaluing of a particular asset, and then you can basically make decisions from there. So that's what we're looking for, market inefficiencies and seeing if we can take advantage of it. I guess that's the best way to put it. 
Okay, so um, you talked about knowing bonds and um, securities. So I'm just wondering, do you have to, like, if you want to be an asset manager or an effective asset manager, do you have to watch the news frequently, like something like Bloomberg? Or can you get by without? Oh, yes, you have to, you have to follow the news. <laughs> information is power, right? So yes. if, you don't, if you don't have that information, then... Um, you know, you'll be trading behind everybody else. But the news sometimes is just that it's news and it's news for everybody. So it doesn't really give you a competitive advantage um, if that's all you rely on, right? You have to look at the news. You have to be able to predict the news before it comes and try to work from there. Okay, so where would you recommend that people get their information from for the market? Oh, Bloomberg is an excellent, excellent source if you can get it. Um, sorry, excuse me. So Bloomberg is an excellent source if you can get it. Um, there are other sources um, from the other financial news type channels like CNBC, things of that nature. But um, what I would do, what I, what I would recommend is depend on the area that you're working working at, say for me, if you're working out of Nigeria, for instance, there are a few sites, there are a few companies that send out regular notices that you can follow. I mean, it's always good to follow the regulatory companies, i.e. things like CBN. You look at things like the NSC. The NSC stands for the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Stock Exchange, yeah. Yes. So you follow information from there as well. So you okay. take all this information in with your own projections of what the future of the, what the country is going to be or the future of the markets are going to be and they use all that information to make investment decisions today okay thank you all right uh, it's one thing to have a job it's another thing to enjoy it what do you really enjoy about your profession as an assets manager what do you enjoy about it uh so um Money? like i <laughs> <laughs> yes it could be the money <laughs> okay so um this is what i'm gonna say i'm gonna say um i mean you can get, you can make money from pretty much every field right depending on what stage of that field that you you are um but what i would say about passion is you have to love what you do okay. it, it might not be something you might be able to put a finger on but you have to enjoy what you do. And I'll tell you a bit about my story. Um, I remember when I was trying to make a career choice and one of my um, one of my role models basically asked me, okay, so what, what will you do right now for free, right? What is that job that you're, you're willing to do without getting paid? I mean, I'm not saying that you can't find a job that you won't pay you, but you know, to try to try to narrow down what your interests are, because there are challenges in every job, exactly. right? There are challenges yeah, in every right. industry, and it's that passion, it's that love for what you do that will keep you going when things are not moving smoothly, so to speak. So, what do I like about my job? Oh, I like the, I like the the newness of it all, the, the, the fact, the volatility of it all, the fact that things change on a daily basis, you have to study, you have to figure out. And then it's also very rewarding when you make a right decision. And, okay. you know, you see, you see the rewards come out and not just in, not just in qualitative things, but, but actually quantitative when you actually see, okay, you know what, I made this decision and I made X amount of money from it. So part of the reason I got into asset management in the first place was because I wanted to learn personal money management, okay. right? I figured, you know what, I'm not enjoying my time in, in Nestle so much because it was a bit repetitive. I was working in a lab and, you know, basically tested the same samples on a daily basis. Okay. It kind of got a little slow for me. So I figured, you know what, let me go and learn something different. And while I figure out what I want to do, let me learn something that will benefit me. So that when I finally make that money, I will know how to manage it. Mm -hmm. So I got I transferred to financial services and style learning as a migrant, and I found my home. Um, um, I like numbers. Numbers make sense. 
numbers numbers work you know you, you you project something i don't need to learn any latin names from chemistry anymore <laughs> if i'm working with numbers i know numbers i calculate something it should give me something else you know things like that uh nigeria market is a bit more challenging than that but each challenge comes with its own rewards that's the way i look at it Okay, thank you. So um, earlier you said you, you chipped in um, education, that you can manage assets in education. So we're wondering what other sectors can people with asset management work in, like besides financial services? Are there other sectors that people can work in? And what companies, like if you could give us examples of companies in Nigeria and outside Nigeria, where people with an asset management background can work in? Okay, I, that's that's a good question. Um, excuse me. Now, essentially, excuse me. Essentially, what asset management comes down to is you're trying to manage certain financial resources, right, and manage them efficiently to ensure that you're making uh, you're making profits from them. Now, if I worked in a school, for instance, and like a school like Green Springs, and Green Springs has monies that they, they're not really sure what to do with, or monies that come in on a regular basis, they need a proper cash management system. That's, it, it might get to the level where you might require an, you know, a specialized asset manager to handle your, your um, accounts. But in truth, every company has, um, almost every company has a CFO figure, a chief financial officer or a finance team. And usually within that finance team, as part of their responsibilities is to manage assets. So um, fine, it might not be primarily to make money. It might just be to make sure that, that they're working efficiently for you. But eventually, if it gets to the point where your assets are substantial enough, you might it might actually be expedient for you to look for how you can make additional funds from those assets. And I'll give you examples. Um, in the oil and gas um all our gas services you know you have major companies like total you have major companies like mobile who have dedicated asset management teams they manage they manage their their their, their pension portfolios they manage uh they have something called a closed pension fund um they also manage you know the the cash flows uh you know because they have large amounts of cash you know sometimes that needs to be managed before it gets applied to something else also, it's also managing things like fluctuations in the market. So you might need to buy things like derivatives to ensure that you protect the company against risk, you know, and little things like that. So it's in the FMCGs as well. FMC, in the, that's fast yeah. moving consumer goods. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's in pretty much every, almost every field, depending on if you're big enough to handle it or else your finance team will just double as asset managers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So okay. to answer your question, everybody requires some level of asset management. Okay. okay. That's so, great. Since every you anybody can um work anywhere, would you advise one to um would you say there are better opportunities in the government sector or in the public sector, private sector? For oh, asset management? Yes, please. Oh, most definitely in the private sector. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Most definitely the private sector. Um, so, I mean, the very nature of the way government works is you have a budget and then cash is dispersed to you based on the budget that you have. It doesn't really give you much wiggle room for things. And especially now in the government that we're in, where you have a treasury a single account that everybody's supposed to move their revenues to, right? It leaves you with very little to manage in terms of financial assets yes you might have some um some real assets like property and things to manage but more often than not the goal of government parastatals isn't to generate revenue from investments it's to serve the purpose to which they were created if it generates some revenue great they'll probably go to the federal ministry of finance and you're going to definitely have asset managers there so if unless you're looking to work in a ministry of finance of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, you're more likely to find more joy in the private sector. 
and the pay is better. Okay. Okay. So what is the future of asset management? Like, I mean, with I'm thinking with evolution of technology, will people have facilities where they can, you know, manage the assets themselves that they will need an asset manager? So will it be still will it still be relevant in like 20 years' time? <laughs> Oh, yes, most definitely. Um, people already have those technologies in hand. I'm sure um, a bunch of people here have different apps that they use to manage some of their investments already. I mean, mm -hmm. even the even um, people in school essentially have a few apps here and there. There are apps that you can use to buy stocks in America. There are apps you can use to basically put all your investments in one place and so you can watch how it how, how how it's all working and even more and more banks have started to come up with uh how they put the banking platforms where you can have a lot of your investments being measured there um take for instance my company fbm quest trustees has um a, a basically a management platform where essentially all the investments in your trust can be seen in one investment pool so that way you can see it and make decisions based on what you have by yourself. However, the job of an asset manager isn't in the executing, it's in the planning, okay. you know, it's in the, it's in the project and it's in, it's in the, it's in the initiative, so to speak. So, I mean, anybody can execute. All you have to do is tell somebody, oh, go and buy this. But how do you know that's the right thing to buy? That's yeah. where that's where the asset manager comes in. Comes in, and that skill is always going to be required because ultimately in life we're all going to still be managing assets at one to one stage or another. Come in hundred years, the assets might be profoundly different, the type of assets might be profoundly different, but somebody's going to still need to manage them, and somebody's still going to need to get the best value from them, and that is where an asset manager manager would always make his bread. Okay. okay thank you all right so um i know it's one um now we need to know a lot of people want to have jobs and they need that gigantic money you know they need to take this <laughs> salary at the end of the day or at the end of the month we need to be smiling so what's the salary range for an asset manager <sighs> you oh, have wow. an idea yeah we need to know Oh, well, um, now it's really it's really industry specific. It really depends okay. on where you are, um, and it'll be hard to peg it to any particular thing. But what I will say is this: you're more valued if you have your CFA certification than if you don't. Okay. The way you're more valued if you have a master's than if you don't, you know, and um, uh, the rewards can be pretty decent. Again, for asset managers or for people who are looking for a career in asset management, what I also say is this: um, the salary is good. Don't get me wrong, but the skills that you're going to learn for your own self to manage your own assets is probably the more valuable tool for me. So, the fact that you pay me I don't know, a millionaire a month—that's great. But if I know how to turn that millionaire a month to 1.5 millionaire a month through investments, that's even better. Yeah. You know, because I'll keep doing that for the rest of my lifetime. You know, yeah. So even after I retire, I'll still have some of these asset management skills that I can be sitting in my house with my grandchildren running around and I'm still making investment decisions on my laptop. Mm -hmm. You know? So I would say focus less on the immediate rewards. Okay. And Pretty much on the long-term goals and long-term possible long-term rewards of of this career. Okay, it's so you're trying to. Sorry, sorry, just sorry. Say... It's important that you find a right company okay. that trains you the right way. You know, don't just you know follow the money and get stuck somewhere where you don't have um, you, you don't learn enough. You know, but it, it, that that would help groom you to acquire the skills you require. Yeah, pretty much in any, every field, really. You can be a teacher, and you want to you want to you want to you want to learn. Uh, you want to work in a place where it allows you to broaden your skill set, as opposed, you know, what 
a government school that says, okay, you are the English teacher and this is all you're going to do or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm trying to say. You are, you are trying to ask a question. Okay. Um, I think, no, you've answered the question. I wanted to say, it, we're trying to say it's a, it takes a long time to make that money. You don't make the money immediately to take a longer while because you have to gain experience. Is that what you're trying to say? Um, yes and no. Again, I, I keep on saying, let's, let's not focus on, on money alone. Money it's is really, important to, but, <laughs> it's very, yeah, lots of students want to know that they are going to, if they enter this career path, they will need to make a lot of, you know, so it's sure very important. I'm sure a lot of students watch shows like Billions and uh, yeah. things like The Wolf of Wall Street. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's pretty interesting when you see this, because that's not real life. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot slower, it's a lot calm, calmer, but I would not tell you opportunities might not, I would not arise. Now, take this year for, for instance, it's been, pretty, pretty, it's been a pretty challenging year for many people, right? But right. some astute asset managers, some investment people are pretty much going to church with huge testimonies right now because there was such market volatility which is bread and butter for the average investor. Okay. And with, with that market volatility, some people were able to make some significant amount of money. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people lost money too. Mm -hmm. But if you have the required skill set, and if you, uh, I don't want to say you're fortunate, but if you are fortunate as well, then essentially your reward could come at any time and then the salary will be less of a... Uh, less important to you than say, for instance, your investment in First Bank that has gone up by 200%. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, you, you mentioned um, being with your grandchildren and making investment decisions. So are you saying there's no retirement age? Because like I was talking to a friend's mom who works, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, she's worked in a different field, but basically she retired, she turned 60, and she retired. So is there a retirement age for being an asset manager or can you continue until your deathbed? <laughs> so you probably can't continue working for um, a company unless it's yours. Okay, um, fair enough. <laughs> unless it's your company. But the, the point I was trying to make there was that because you already have this skill set, when it comes to managing your own portfolio, your own money, right? Um, at age 60, nobody, nobody's going to stop you from managing your money. If you're 80 and you want to choose to manage it in the way that you seem fit, nobody can stop you either. So if you have those skills, you're less reliant. You might still use an asset manager, a professional asset manager, don't get me wrong. But yeah, you're, you're more independent. You can, you can take decisions by yourself because you've acquired those skill sets. The same way, even if a doctor retires, doesn't mean the doctor can't still, you know, um diagnose you know illnesses if by, by by listening to symptoms doesn't mean the teacher cannot still teach her grandkids at 85 you know so i'm just saying that this skill set stay with you for life and yeah. in, in this in this world that we're trying to manage um our own assets it comes in very handy okay okay thank you all right how do you know um what assets are profitable to manage? Okay, um, that's that's interesting. Um, I guess the simple way to look at it is this: you're looking out for things that are mispriced. Okay. Let me explain. Um, I, I guess your question is not what assets are profitable to manage, or how do you know when when to invest in a particular asset to make money, right? Right. Yeah. So you're looking for mispricing in the market. That's pretty much what you're doing. Um, it doesn't have to just be financial markets. You look, that's what you do in everything. I mean, if you want to buy a car and you want to sell the car to make some money, then you look for the car that is undervalued, so to speak, right? right. So if you see a car that is running at half the price that it should be running, then that's an opportunity for you to buy the car and sell it on at a later date and make a profit, yes? Now, the good part about investment management sometimes, depending on where you are investing or what type of asset it is, sometimes you can make money the other way. So say for instance, I see it, I have a car 
that all of a sudden somebody is looking to pay 20 million naira for. Whereas I know the car is only valued at 10 and that person must just be very happy that he has money. Yeah, I can sell mm -hmm. that car and then a few months down the line when everything has calmed down, I can go back and buy that same car for 10 million naira and I'll have, I'll have booked the profits. So same thing with um, financial instruments. Um, treasury bills, let me use treasury bills as an example. I can look to say, okay, you know what? I'm looking at the markets right now and I see treasury bills at a ridiculously low level of 0.45%. So I said, you know what? Hey, let me sell these treasury bills now because I know that the, 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 the rates are going to go up and then I buy it at a higher level. So what that means is I have sold a treasury bill that I didn't necessarily have and gone to buy it back at a slightly higher level and made a significant profit. There are many ways you can look at it, but if you're going to take away something, you're looking for mispricing in the market yeah. and they're looking to take advantage of those mispricings. Okay. Well, wow. interesting. Thank you. Very. Thank you. So, um, see, the, from what I get from all this, I, it seems like it is risky managing people's assets so what is the risk involved like can you go to jail if you mismanage people's assets because it seems like a lot of responsibility um okay so one of the asset manager or portfolio manager in this case one of his main jobs is to manage risk okay. right um let me give you a for instance you've had the phrase the higher your risk the higher your reward Right? Yes. <laughs> okay. It's very true. So the, 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 the higher the risk you take, you should be compensated with the higher reward if it works out. The problem is that the higher the risk you take means the higher chances that you can lose money off a exactly. particular Exactly. Right? So what a portfolio buyer just seeks to do or what an asset manager seeks to do is say, okay, you know what? These are the risks of the different assets I'm managing. Now, how can I combine them in such a way that the cumulative risk is slightly reduced? I don't want to get too technical here, but mm -hmm. to answer your question directly, yes, we focus on risk. Yes, it's a bit risky, but that's what you do. You're supposed to look for ways to ameliorate that, those risks and still make a profit off of it. Um, in terms of managing people's portfolios and going to jail, well, as long as you're doing the right thing, i.e., you're not, you're not selling somebody's portfolio that you have no rights to sell. Okay. You know, okay. um, I, don't see, I don't see that kind of problem happening. Now, let me give you, so what it is is this. We have clients who are either discretionary or non-discretionary. In other words, discretionary portfolios are, are portfolios where the client gives you the authority and says, you know what, this is my money, manage it as you deem fit, yeah. right? So I take the, I, I look for the investment opportunities, I take the investment decisions, you know, and I tell the clients at the end of a particular period, they would say every, every month or every year, that, okay, you know what, these are the things I did this year, this is how much you have now. It could be a profit, it could be a loss. A non-discretionary portfolio is the client coming to say, okay, to take my money, right? but don't do anything unless I ask you to. Yeah, so my okay. job here is I go to the client and tell the client, okay, you know what, there's an opportunity here. Do you want to do this? And then the client has to put it in writing, like, okay, yes, please go ahead and do this. And okay. then that way, that way I'm absolved of all blame if anything goes wrong way, you know? So okay. as long as you don't, because I know a few years, uh, so during the dark days of our, of our markets, I know there was a time when stockbrokers were selling people's shares in the hope that they could make some money off of it and buy it back. But um, they had no rights to. And yeah, a few people went to jail. But as long as you're not doing, you're not mm. trying to make sharp practices and you're following the rules, I don't, I, I mean, you might have an angry client, an upset client if you lose money. But in terms of liability, I don't think you'll have any. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, you just said um, something about having angry clients when you lose money. So you're trying to say you don't always guarantee good returns on customer assets. 
Oh no, you can't. You, you can't. It's it's hard to guarantee returns. Don't get me wrong. There there are investment investment opportunities or investment assets that yes, your returns are essentially guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Um, but let me give you an example. If Ishama, you you set up a company and you want to raise some money and you're looking for investors, right? Right. We can choose to invest in your company, right? And you promise to pay us 10% every year, right? Okay. That, is, that is a guaranteed return. Mm -hmm. The risk there is if you're not a good manager, your company might fail. Okay. And then I will lose the money I have invested in the, in the beginning, which is bad. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so some people might call that a guaranteed rate of return, but there's still a risk that the money might be lost. But in, that's that's fixed income essentially. But in other types of investment assets like equities or like um, derivatives or commodities, where the prices move up and down, there are a lot of us in this market, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. anything can can make the, pro the prices move up and down. It could be bad decisions or good decisions by the companies. It could be uh, a policy decision by the country or by the regulators. Or it could just be coronavirus, for instance, something that will just come and knock everybody all down, right? Um, take, for instance, this year, if you had, a, if you, if you, coming into 2020, if you were an investor in airlines, say you had Delta shares or you had United Airlines shares, you would be losing a lot of money because since they couldn't fly due to yeah. the pandemic. All their all their shares tanked. Now, on the flip side, now that there are talks of vaccines and some lockdowns are being eased, all those share prices have gone way back up. So, if I had bought those shares in May, for instance, I'll probably be seeing a two hundred percent, no, maybe not two hundred, maybe about a sixty to one hundred percent return. You know, there are a few other companies that have made ridiculous returns in this year. I mean, I'm looking at the likes of Tesla which yeah. belies yeah. logic. Um, but Amazon has also performed pretty pretty decently Even this Zoom. year. And Even Zoom, Zoom, exactly. Yeah. Zoom, Zoom, has, Zoom has been around for years and nobody really cared. Yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden, the fact that we're all stuck at home and all using Zoom now, they, yes. the, their prices have just gone through the roof. You know? And this, I think Zoom has actually gone up about 200% if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so these are these are opportunities that could just arise. So at, at, the, at the start of the pandemic, when people started to lock down, some investors looked at the market and said, okay, hey, what are the what are the areas that will benefit? And most of the areas were in tech. Right? So if you look at tech stocks, they tended to rise during this 2020. Yes. Um, some of them are pulling back a little bit now. Now that you know we're reopening places, we might not rely on Zoom as much as we used to, but yeah, so these are the ups and downs that could happen. You, what you do as an asset manager is you do your best to try to predict where things are going to go. You you win some, you lose some. The hope is that you win a lot more than you lose. You lose, yeah, yeah. This is like law, kind of. You can't win all your cases. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So have you ever had any conflict of interest with <laughs> um, your clients and how did you resolve it? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, like, like, I don't know, insider, you know, not insider trading. No. I mean, I don't know if that applies. I know. Yeah. It does. So let me give you a for instance. You had me use First Bank as an example because I work with FBN Quest Trustees. Yeah. Right? But as a matter of policy, I, I let my clients know that, look, I, I cannot recommend First Bank to you because of a conflict of interest. You know, it's in my interest, as a staff of, well, the group, it's in my interest for you to buy the shares. It'll make us a little bit more valuable. Exactly. You know, but also, I also know some things on the inside that I will uh, have with this that might influence my de my decision making, which comes to the insider trading you're talking about. Yeah. You know, so these are some of the conflicts of interest that you you might experience. Also, for large type investments. You, you also have to be careful about your own personal investment. Say, for instance, um, 
I'm a heavy investor in Total personally, right? And I have okay. a client that wants to sell Total, a heavy amount of Total. I know that him coming to the market to sell that amount of Total is going to make me lose money. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So those are conflicts of interest that might arise. What we do in our own company is um, you declare to the portfolios that you're going to manage if you have any interest in the kind of companies that they are interested in so that they know that, okay, you know what, if you have to speak, if you have any personal interests, so if you have to speak on a particular investment decision, at least they are aware that, you know what, it might not be, you You might be try to be as professional as possible, but okay. it might be tainted a little by what you have. So at least exactly. the clients are you disclose. Disclosure okay. is pretty important in asset management okay. as well. Okay. Some people just say, look, you know what, instead of um, going through that problem, let me have an asset manager have a discretionary um, authority over my account. So I don't need, I don't know what's, what's what he's doing with the money. He's just doing stuff with the money. He's just doing, yeah. And he's giving me a report. So that way I'm free from any kind of conflicts of interest since okay. it's an implied trust in a sense. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's, those are some of the things we do. Okay, cool. All right, um, what advice would you give someone who is considering um, this career path? Well, how would you advise or convince someone? Convince? Yeah. If I'm I, confused I, and I want to pick between asset management and some other career, how would you? My first what? question would be, okay. what are you good at? Okay. Right? You need to know what you're good at. You need to know where your strengths are. Uh, you need to know what your flair is for. You need to know what you have a flair for. So, um, like I earlier mentioned, you need to have, you need to be good with numbers. I mean, there's no two ways about it unless you want to be in sales. And even in sales, you have to have a rudimentary knowledge of numbers as well. You know, you need to also have analytical skills if you're going to be a proper asset manager. You need to be able to analyze events, analyze results. You know, you hear a bank come out with a Q4 results. You need to be able to look at it, see, okay, where where the possibilities are, if the bank is got if bank is well positioned for long-term growth, ETC, right? But apart from that, um, you need to know what you enjoy doing. Okay. It's, it's, it's important because sometimes it can be a grueling job. Um, you also need to be, how do I put this? Um, on an evil kill, tempor te uh, how do I say this? Your personality. Okay. You must not be. You must not. You must not get too down with bad results, and you must not get too excited with good results because emotions can lead you to make bad decisions. You know, these are things to all consider when you're looking for a, looking for a career in asset management. If you want to learn the basics of asset management, management to manage your own assets, that's fine. But if you want to go through it as a professional career, it can be time consuming. It can be quite tasking mentally. Okay. It, it can be pretty frustrating because a lot of the factors are outside your, your own control. Okay. I mean, I cannot determine what the company is going to do that I'm about to invest in. I cannot determine what the government is going to do. Mm -hmm. I cannot determine what my fellow asset managers are going to do to scatter the market. Okay. You know? So I, I need to be temperate, uh, to, to be mentally on an even kill and not be too bogged down by def by negative negative events or negative um, actions. And I, I wasn't to get over elated with positive moves as well. Okay. It's always good to find, you know, an, an even kill. So I, that's what I would advise the person. I mean, what makes you happy? Where, where are your strengths? Okay. You need to have this particular level of, this particular types of skills. Okay. And um, ultimately, What's your personality like? Okay. You know, and are you sure you're ready for the grind? If you are, then great. We could always use more asset managers. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so um, at what age would you advise people to start investing? Like how young can your clients be? Because I mean, we live in an era where people of all ages need to be aware of 
opportunities? Oh, great. This, this, this is a lovely question. Um, I think as soon as you get money, you should invest. As soon as you, you, you can get pocket money, you should start considering investing. Okay, okay. Um, it, it's, there used to be a graphic I used to put up um, to some of my clients, which showed, uh, this was a few years back, and that has, that has changed somewhat. But if you had steadily invested in a particular stock, over a period of time, you'd be surprised at what returns that you 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 would get at the end of the day. So it's it's all about consistent investing, putting certain monies aside, and at least consistent wise investing, and um, it could be super rewarding, particularly later in life where those real expenses start to come in. Yeah, school fees, weddings, retirement. These are the things that are going to carry you on, even if you are not a career asset manager. But what I would tell um, the young people listening is it's okay to put a certain amount of your money aside for investing. You can put it in a savings account for now, or you can put it in a mutual fund, you know, until you, until you find a good investment opportunity to put it, or if you find an asset manager that can advise you to take on something a little bit more risky because when you're young is when you can take the risks you know? yeah. <laughs> and it can be very very rewarding i know a number of young people who have invested in various types of assets from bitcoin to actual stocks on the nigerian stock exchange and quite frankly by the time they were 30 they could retire yeah. and that 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 is a gift for anyone so to answer your question once again, as young as you, as long as you can, from the day you start getting money, yes, please, that's the day you should start investing. Or, you know, at least getting your parents to invest on your behalf. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. many parents have things like, like my company, we offer trust services where parents tend to open trust for their kids. I'm sure what you know what that means. Where essentially they put money aside and, and invest in different types of assets. So to, to meet particular goals, it could be, you know what, I have a five-year-old and I want that five-year-old to one day go to Harvard. Okay. So I can put yeah. money aside on a periodic basis, um, work with my asset manager and say, okay, you know what, what do I need to do to get here? And then we work out a plan for you. And that money starts to pile up. Sometimes it might end up being that, you know, you don't even need all that money. So you might have a clause in there in your trust where it says, okay, fine, after they're paying for the education of my child, the the balance in the accounts can now go to him, him or, yeah. um, when they hit 30 or the day after they get married to help them start their mar their life. You know, things yeah. like that. It's, it's actually very laudable. I mean, you have a number of stories um, littered through time where people have set, set up trusts and they're their children, their grandchildren have benefited immensely from it. And people who didn't, well, we've seen squabbles and disintegration of legacies, you know. So, yes, again, as soon as you can start to invest, I enjoy the parents to start to invest with their children as early as possible, preferably creating a trust structure and um, watch the rewards come in. All right. Um, thank, thank you. For thank that. you very much. Yeah. Okay. So you said you recommend parents and students to start investing. So as we're about to come to the end of today's um, program, I want you to recommend for me, Ms. Soluzo, Dr. Wilson, and our parents and students here right now, we want to invest on something, just share, even if it's two things we can invest on. We need to start investing. I want to start investing. I know Miss Soluzo, she has been very, very attentive and she has been jotting down a lot of things. So we want to start investing. Me, I want to invest. I know a lot of parents right now want to invest too. Did I tell you that asset management wasn't free? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> you told me not to concentrate on money, Mr. Dunaya. Now you're talking about money. Okay. Um... What I would say is this, and this might not be particularly popular. What I would say is two different things. Okay. One, 
it's a little late in the day, but with the way the country is going, I would say start looking to diversify your investments into um, foreign currency type of investments. It will help you hedge against the devaluation of the currency, which a lot of people have expected. We've already had it devalued three times this year. Yeah. And, and I mean, black market rates are about 470 naira to a dollar. So if you had invested in dollar-based investments, even if it was earning 0%, right? It moved from 360 to 475. So technically speaking, you've already made a 30% return just like yeah. that, you know? Um, so number one, I'll tell you, look for more um, foreign currency exposure in terms of your investments. Okay. It could be in Euro bonds, it could be in equities. It could just be holding the cash. It's not a problem. Okay. The second thing is a little bit more controversial. I would probably say speak to your investment manager and consider equities. Okay. If the markets, the markets are cyclical, what we have is usually the huge crashes, and then eventually, after a few years, you know things start to look normal again. Things start to get better again. There are a number of companies on the Nigerian Stock Exchange that are currently undervalued, in in my own view. And two years down the line, some people will be smiling with 100%, 150% returns on their investments. You know, some people will be like, well, you know, we didn't know that the stock market was going to go up. Yeah. So I, our advice is that you speak to your investment manager and see what opportunities are out there. But those are the two things I'll probably say foreign currency investments or foreign currency exposure, even if it means you putting your dollars under your pillow okay. and consider okay. equity. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Odunaya. Um, I don't know if we have more questions. If you have questions, please, can you share it with us in the, um, in the, chat, in the chat room? Okay, um, while we wait, Ms. Saluzo, can you take the last question, please? Um, well, I just wanted to, I mean, you just said there is no free though. <laughs> advice is not free but i'm very curious and i'm sure that people are curious um bitcoin because you mentioned bitcoin i i am very I, it seems shady to me but people a lot of people are like because yesterday apparently i saw something yesterday last night apparently i saw like bitcoin has gone up to i don't what even understand what that means so is bitcoin a is it something good to invest in because we still don't know what it is Okay, um, <laughs> don't worry, I'm, I'm with you on this. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty old school. I don't, I'm not crazy about Bitcoin. I don't fully understand it myself. Um, but essentially, it's, it's, I'm looking for how to explain it without using too many technical terms. But it's a, it's a type of currency exchange, so to speak, that is not beholden to any com country. It's not um, tied to any government. And that's where my problem is. It's also not tied to any specific type of assets. So for me, I'm like, look, what gives it its value? But I guess mm -hmm. people have found value in the fact that, you know, it's it's a nimble currency. It's not tied to any government. You can do transactions, large sums of money with relative anonymity. And um, demand has driven it up to levels that... I would never have foreseen. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, that I first heard about Bitcoin or about seven years ago, there and thereabouts. I was talking to my brother and um, we talked about it and we, 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 he asked if it was a good investment. I said, I, I didn't know. And then Bitcoin was what? $2, $3 per Bitcoin? No. Now it's $20,000 for one Bitcoin. So, the reason I brought up Bitcoin was young people, it's young people I know that invested in it. And they were willing to throw away, hey, $2 here, $1 here. And then all of a sudden now they're sitting on huge amounts of money. Although many of them sold out when it was $1,000 or $5,000. But that's still an amazing return for a throwaway investment. Again, I don't fully trust it. So I'm not recommending you invest in Bitcoin. I'm just letting you know that, you know, it, 
it's when you're young that you can take advantage of yeah. you know high risk instruments and sometimes it can get this rewarding but many times you would lose your money but you know you're young you can make it back okay um someone is asking can a company buy shares from other companies yeah, most definitely most definitely um you can you can open a corporate account as a as a company say for instance green springs decides uh they want to have an investment account there are probably some restrictions i'm not sure what your regulators say but you can choose to have investments in banks in insurance companies things like that as long as there's no conflict of interest no insider trading things of that nature yes companies can invest in other companies Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Odunaya. Please, can everyone turn on their camera? Dr. Wilson is requesting that everyone turns on their camera. Thank you so much, Mr. Odunaya. This um, session was very informative and I wish we had this, okay, we didn't know the co um, whole COVID thing was going to happen, but um, if we had known, I think this December would have been fantastic for me. I don't know. What do you think, Ms. Soluzo? Would you have had a fantastic um, Christmas? I know it's still fantastic because we thank God for life, but I know I would have been yeah. you know? <laughs> Dr. Wilson, what do you think? Where would you be now if you had had this webinar in January or some time ago? I would be wealthier. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's good information. Really appreciate uh, everything you said, Mr. Odenaya. You know, information is timely. And, you know, certainly we need it. And I think uh, like Mrs. Um, uh, Ahmadi is saying that, you know, we had information and knowledge beforehand when things happen and before they happen, we can plan better. You know, we can, we can pace our money. And so there's so many businesses and all who have gone out of business because they did not manage properly. They didn't foresee this coming. You know, yeah. so certainly like you're saying with the asset man uh, management, you have to also plan for catastrophes, yeah. you know, and to um, to make sure that you have that nest egg uh, that you can survive with. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's um, a rainy day fund has never been more apt in this time. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Odunaya, for taking our time to talk to us. We appreciate you. Dr. Wilson, please. Um, again, on behalf of Green... Spring School, we, we thank you for the timely information. We thank you for giving us your Saturday um, deeply. I have to hop off right now, but thank you all so much. Thank you, Ms. Sotomayor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. thank you for having me. Thank you so much, everyone, thank for you, coming. Dunaya. Thank you so much, Mr. Dunaya. Merry Christmas. We wish you Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, everyone. I Merry hope you. Merry Christmas and see you in 2021 i can't wait to Amen. welcome all of you okay god bless you all and thank you so much again for joining this webinar bye bye thank you bye, bye.